for this, the Information Technology Year, BBC Two begins a new series now that explores the world of information science in the computer programme. We've seen Bad Influence, we've uh, looked at Games Master. I thought we could do some commentary, or I could do some commentary. 82 is Information Technology Year. Of a computer programme. Of information technology, and the government is even spending a great deal of money on publicising it. But what is information technology? All it really means is the world of computers. But why have they suddenly become so important? And what should we, as non-computer experts, know about them? Well, that's exactly what I shall be finding out during this series. One thing I know already, don't expect the computer revolution to happen tomorrow. It's happening now. It's a very serious thing here. Yeah, this is the computer program. This uh, first aired in 1982. It ran from the 11th of January to the 15th of March. Um, presented by Chris Searle and Ian McNaught Davis. And it just introduced the UK and it was broadcast in the US by PBS in 1983 to the world of computers. And this is the programme the BBC Micro was originally devised for. Oh, Stonehenge. I remember watching these programmes back in infant school. I d- <laughs> Very early computing days and my mind was just... I, th- I think this is where it all started, my love for... The digital. For centuries, man has searched for tools to help him with complex calculations. I suppose the fingers were the first. Ten of them, they're easy to use, they're portable, but they're limited in application. This is Ian McNaught. Recently, a theory has emerged that this was built 5,000 years ago as a complex astronomical computer to calculate the movements of the sun and the moon. Listen to that music. I love it. It's so 80s. So. It sounds hard to accept. But if this was mysterious, I thought it'd be interesting to compare it with one of the early large scale computers that were around in the 50s. There's many similarities. Firstly, very few people understood how they worked. At Stonehenge, you had to be a member of a hierarchical priesthood, and it took several years before you learnt its secrets. On the early computers, you had to have a degree in math. Stonehenge was like you were even allowed through the Intel or IBM. At the time Stonehenge was built, the society was mainly agricultural. Forecasting the seasons was vital. From the position of the rising sun in relation to these stones, the approach of spring and winter could be forecast. But if you wanted to reprogram Stonehenge to base the calendar on lunar cycles instead, the stones would have to be moved. (laughs) That would be one hell of a job, wouldn't it? To reprogram those old, unreliable 50s computers. And within 10 years, they were replaced. Stonehenge lasted 1,200 years, but eventually it too became redundant. What well, lasted longer than any Windows operating system? But the climate changed, and no longer was it visible on enough days to justify its existence. So it was abandoned. Look at these gloomy, artistic shots. A mysterious, but rather magnificent pile of old stones. I love it. There's something, there's something almost, almost dark about 80s programs. Quite another matter. The trouble with the stones was their inflexibility. A modern computer can be used for a wide variety of applications. Something ethereal. Extremely complex. For example, a prediction of weather patterns for the whole globe up to 10 days ahead can be produced in just four hours. Wow. That cloud looks like a serpent. The center has one of the fastest and most powerful computers. Okay, this is Chris Searle. Its capacity for work is colossal. These metal megaliths have within them the power to collect weather information from all over the world of temperature, pressure, humidity and so on and process them. Looks a lot like the Centre for Computing History down in Cambridge. Instructions per second and then with a great primordial burp out comes the weather for the next 10 days. Now just to put that in some sort of perspective, if I were to do the same calculation single-handed, even with the aid of a perfectly ordinary pocket calculator like that. Well, look at that, that's a credit card sized one. started well before Stonehenge was even thought of. Or to put it another way, if I gave the job to the entire population of China to share, the chances are they could do the job in four hours. Yes, it outsource it to um, Far Eastern countries. The chances are I wouldn't be able to collect the information even if I could speak Chinese. Now, this here 
is the centre of this colossal machine. That's what the early West was built on. And you get the feeling in the presence of a mighty machine like that that somewhere around the corner there lurks a high priest in white robes who's about to make some ritualistic sacrifice to a peace. Whoa! Peace. But <laughs> what's, he, what's he talking about? ...series is to demystify computers. And so we can say, for instance, that a personal computer like that which is which puts computer power within the reach of everybody's pockets it's highly advertised is quite capable of doing the same he couldn't say could he? he wasn't allowed to say it's a sinclair as the next 81 due to um but it does it slower. advertising so regulations if we wanted to use microcomputers to do the same job as that we'd need about a million of them and in fact, there are over a hundred different makes of small computer now on sale in Britain. You can't have failed to notice the ads in the papers for them. Look at this one. Familiar faces make them seem the answer to the businessman's problem. Commodore Pet. And you don't need a degree in electronic wizardry to use them, it says. And this supplement has no less than five ads for them. And they're all of them clearly directed at the family. Look at that. Give your child an unfair advantage at school. Look at the background as well. We've got pot plants in the background. Stands. Again, full of very tasty adverts. Inside a day, you'll be talking to it like a new friend, it says. And now they're even starting to appear in their own TV. I think that entire stack of magazines was a bit unnecessary. Yeah, you read one page out of one. Ah. Oh, the, the G7000 console. There's over 36 different cartridges. I want you to master and even when you leave the house, you can't get away from them. There are shops in the high street where you can buy a pet, an apple, an acorn, a tangerine, even a new brain. It's even worse today now, mate. Computers suddenly seem to be everywhere. I bet there's hardly a pub in the country which doesn't have a couple of computers in the lounge bar. <laughs> he is one tall chap. Look at that. He can barely play that machine. Well... Like it or not, they're with us for good, but I sometimes get the feeling that the only people who'll get any use out of them, apart from space invaders, are a few highly qualified boffins and some home enthusiasts who until ten years ago would have been making their own television sets. Well, don't despair. This series will show that the computer is within the reach of anybody, including That's me. right, guys. And it's within the reach of all of us. With the task is Ian McNaught Davis. Mac. You've been working with computers since Stonehenge was built, I think, haven't you? I thought you were going to come out with that remark about it being the first silicon chip. Is that what Stonehenge <laughs> is? Just about, yes. Well, I did program those early valve machines, which had several interesting characteristics. First, they were extremely expensive to buy. They were horrendously expensive to run. You needed a resident maintenance engineer just to keep the things going. And uh, they were very slow compared with modern computers. Seats don't really age over the years, do they? But it turns out that the uh, Volkswagen... Uh, Beetle it's all very consistent. I mean, same time as the first large computer was made. Chris is, is a bit dated. Price performance as much as computers had, then you would have had a, a Beetle today doing 600 miles an hour, 30,000. Looks like a high school hour, librarian. After 10,000 years without a service, <laughs> and it would have cost you 50p. So you'd have had a disposable motor car. And in comparison with those early valve machines, that watch, which has got four games on it and tells the time probably has as much logic in it as those very early... Well, four games! What even is What's that? The secret of it? How has it happened? Well, strangely enough, it's this. Silicon. That's what sand is made out of. It's what the silicon chip is made out of. And unlike oil, we're not going to run out of it. Every country's got some of it, and it's extremely cheap. For example, the power of this machine here, which is a fairly sizable mini-computer, mainframe computer, yeah. one day will be on a chip. What a machine. Look at power that. out of a chip, as you have... In this I can't, I don't even know what these machines are. Very few years' time. Right. Well, even before that day comes, computers are still doing some pretty staggering jobs, many of which we take for granted and which would simply not be possible without computer power. They range from the obviously worthwhile to the downright sinister. <laughs> okay. I told you the 80s was dark. And denim. Time of te oh look at that self-driving tractor. This is the age of revolution. The age of where anything could happen. I mean, nuclear war, anything. Well, I mean, 
not much has changed, but it was just everything was so new and what is it that incredible. Makes computers so very useful to us. Is it is it that they're cleverer than we are? No, uh, they're quite stupid in many ways, but in certain it's ways they are very clever. They can handle a vast amount of information, and they can handle it very rapidly. And what's more, they can keep on doing it without making any mistakes night after night after day after night and so on which we can't obviously do right well i can understand that being speak to yourself to sending a man to the moon or running the pentagon or something colossal endless computations but for an ordinary person who just maybe wants to run a small business or something it's very confusing we read ads in the paper you could spend anything from 50 pounds to 5000 pounds on a computer but what use could i get from it well, of course, many of these are set up to show games. This one here, for example. Oh, there's the Vic 20. You can play silly games on them. Never really understood fruit machines on home computers. Program these computers. First of all, it's fun. People enjoy it. And secondly, it's very creative. You can do very interesting and exciting things. It's boundless, the sort of things that you can actually use your creative imagination to do. And thirdly, it might turn out to be useful. Right. Right. What's that machine in the background? That looks interesting. It looks like some sort of oscilloscope hybrid. Won't find the use for a computer. Right. Now, supposing I wanted to use a computer for my business. I'm a freelance journalist. I mean, let's take my example as maybe a, a typical one. What gear do I need? Because there's a terrifically wide range of choice. Well, of course, you need the computer with a keyboard. Yes. Something like this. You need a, a video screen. You need a straightforward cassette recorder to store your programs on as much as anything. Right. Well, look, I love dot matrix printers. Fed through with those continuous sheets. It's not necessary for me to do a dot matrix printed sound, is it? Instead of on the ordinary magnetic cassette. And that's the equipment you'd need. Right. Well, business, as Max said, and particularly small business, is the fastest growing area to which person. I'm surprised we haven't cracked the BBC Micro out yet. Was it, even, was it even ready? has been finding out just how small some of those businesses are. Maybe they didn't get it until the second episode. The BBC Micro was released in 1981, so it would have just come... It would only, this is broadcast on the 11th of January 1982, so it wouldn't have been out for long. Those are ten. Those are ten. Oh, you've got something there at six. Oh, look at that sweet shop. That's amazing. It's on the shelves. The shopkeeper must do an awful lot of bookkeeping, both to check the stores and to keep up the orders to all the suppliers. 12th of October 1981. In addition, Phyllis Arundel wanted to know more frequently than her accountant. Well, 35 her years ago. Position. She'd seen microcomputers at okay, hammering away on a Commodore pet. She knows exactly what she's doing. Sweet shop owners have a computer. Once you actually <laughs> combined with that ancient yeah, yeah. till, that <laughs> blank screen facing you, weren't you rather apprehensive? No. You knew what to do already, did you? Well, uh, I mean, it looked like a typewriter. Didn't oh, it? she's all over it. She has got it covered. And I was fascinated by the little bits that came up on the screen in front of me and having a printer and able to press another button and it, it came out on the printer at the side. It was great fun. Now, has it actually helped you in your business? Yeah. Do you think? Well, it hasn't financially uh, helped. It hasn't brought in more custom, which is what I would need. But what it has done, it's made. Uh, it's given me a lot more time. I mean, the the, the jobs that took ages, you know, but manually. Uh, 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 now it's done in seconds. So we can we can safely assume that she spent so much on her computer, but her business probably closed down within the next couple of weeks. Phyllis Arundale several hours bookwork every night, and that's Terry's chocolate orange there. Was that? Got all those chocolate brands. What, what? What is that? Is that a security door? Cutting edge. I wouldn't have bought a Commodore Pet if I were you. I would have spent some money on your door. The day's takings and entering them and the invoices into the computer. Maybe a new till. There's a. It's like a Crime Stoppers alert. Poster beside her. Look at, look, look, look at that photo fit. He's got massive shades on. How can you tell who he is if he's wearing massive shades? Of her current financial position. Because she'd found it so useful, Phyllis thought that a computer might help other people with small businesses. I can't imagine why you... A year ago, she started up a computer I mean, what you, I mean... to take over their paperwork, allowing them to get on with their jobs. Do you see, do you think, the computer side of your business ever taking over from the chocolates? I hope so. 
Yes, it'd be great fun. Maybe this is like because, the foundings uh, of a massive computer company. The chocolate, uh, this business is um, sort of going down because we've got a new bypass and it's uh, affected trade. And uh, uh, in any case, I find that more exciting. I find. I can't imagine you need you need a Commodore PET to exciting. run a sweet shop, would you? Uh, so, I mean. That's cool, Bo. Well, I reckon if Phyllis can get to grips with a microcomputer, then I jolly well ought to be able to... You pedantic <laughs> asshole. <laughs> ...a microcomputer in order to get some value from it. Not necessarily. You can buy a magazine, for example, and get program listings. I love this from... Oh, is that CNVG magazine? Size. And in here, they publish all manner of different sorts of programs. And they list them out for you. And you have how infuriating was that? You type in pages and pages of code, and then there's an error somewhere, and you have no idea what it is. Laborious business, isn't it? Well, you can buy it, of course, on a on a cassette. Oh, there's the BBC Micro. It's all cassette like this. That's just a perfectly ordinary domestic cassette, and it's, yes. presumably that's the same in principle as the proper big computer has, like James Bond films, has big tapes rolling backwards and forwards. It's the same sort of thing. That's exactly the same. Well, in principle, it's the same. That's running about 250 times. Ian's speed. like, what, what the hell are you talking about, mate? James it's Bond films? Down. Ten times or twice as fast. It's always a hundred times or a thousand times as fast. But for our purposes, this is just, it's perfectly good. We have a program in there and we can put it into the machine. Well, let's do it. All right, so far so good. There's a perfectly ordinary domestic cassette recorder. Exactly. OK, connected to this. Now, what happens next? Well, we have to load the program into the machine. So you type, load. L-O-A-D. That's right. Well done, mate. Now, we've got to give it the name of the programme. So he looks a bit on edge, doesn't he? this particular machine, we have to use quotation marks to right. give it the name. So, okay. quotation marks and the name. Oh, it's on the screen. Look at that. We've got an overlay of the code on the screen. This is advanced. Now, we must switch on wow. the set. Yes. And then hit return. And that puts the control back to the computer. And now it's beginning Searching. to search. Right. Now, presumably, as you said, this is a fairly slow and laborious way of, uh, of doing it, and we could speed things up by using one of the floppy disks you were talking about yes, earlier. Yes, on a floppy, this, this, will, this is about 130 times the speed of that, and, of course, it costs correspondingly more. So this takes much. minutes and that takes seconds? Yeah, it'll take half a minute, so that would take be an in flash. No right. time at all. Half a minute no. or no. ten minutes if you're using loading a particularly back. large yeah, game. Because the computer's waiting for you to uh, do your next thing. So that, that's in there. That's it. So, so we, we can, can switch it off. That. And presumably we can check, can we, that what was on there is in there now. Happily, yes. All you have to do is to type out list and it tell you what's in it. List, L-I-S-T. L-I-S-T. Return. As you wow. Know. Whoa. OK, that's and the that programme that was. What, what, what does that programme do? Uh, it's something about three balls okay, there. We've got, we know it's in there. I'm sort of, um, How do we play the game? Just tell it to run. Arknoid clone. Nice simple English words, I must say. And War return, game. That's it. Badminton. The game, it works. Right. War game. Moves the bat. Left with the Z key, right with the X key. Try yeah, to it's, a, it's an Arknoid clone. Bricks to the further back. Score. Hey. Points are allowed. Three balls. Large or small bat. Well, I have an L bat. I wrote one myself back in... Uh, it's a beginner. Press any key. The to early 90s, I think. <laughs> nice multicoloured game, that. I, I see, I see. It's not bad. It's not a bad um, little clone there. Rainbow colouring. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple to play. OK, well, obviously, it's not just for playing games. They're terrific fun, but there must be more to it than that. I really hate to see computers just used for playing games. It, to my mind, it's kind of degrading when they could be used for much more serious purposes. And, of course, there are millions of uses for them, m many of which we're going to look at in this series. For example, you can actually use this to communicate with much larger scale computers through telephone networks. You can use it to communicate with other people who own micros, and you could use it to communicate with, with databases. Oh, the early and internet. That's what I'm going to show you I mean, this was before well before the internet. They're talking about and we do bulletin boards and dial up so computers, star, computer networks. Press tell. Press tell. Um, the Prestel the service is like automatically through the ordinary telephone lines, and we can. Of course, the BBC the Micro could do um, teletext graphics. There we go. Applies to weather forecasts and so on. And key something rather to continue. That's so. the old hash up there, which is a shift and a hash. <laughs> old hash. <is> a <laughs> what would you like to do? Well, I, we thought about this before the program started, and I've decided I want to fly to Paris. One ticket. Mm. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> well, there we go. Travel. Hi, wants to go with it. Okay. Two. 
Uh, and a Presto. Presto, I've never heard of it. But I'll take a chance. Oh, we don't want to book a real friendly. ticket on one of the others. I mean, I mean, I wonder how many people actually used this sort of Put one in there. And if that service the thing is, that's where it's going to come. All right, one and a hash. And a hash. I guess it was more something you'd have in an, a tourist office used by this date of travel staff, isn't it? Workers rather than in the home. Just like that. Yeah, that's it. You're not likely to book your holiday on your BBC Micro, are you? Here goes. I hope it works. Good afternoon. Oh, he's off. He's, he's, he's doing it. I hope you've got a seat for me on the half past six flight to Paris this evening. Hi, sir. Can I have your name, please? Sal. So, S-E-R-E. Hello, Sal. Yes, sir. The VA 316 at 18.30. Uh, how would you like to pay? Uh, by credit card. The fare is £64. £64. Paid for by the TV licence payer, no doubt. This flight is now boarding at gate 25. Well, obviously Heathrow is computer -like. I hope you're going to catch that plane. It's now fly with so many passengers over such colossal distances at such enormous speeds. Airlines depend now completely on computers because the only way they can sell tickets reasonably cheaply is by having full planes. And the other luxury of this colossal computer network is that I can cancel at any time I feel like it, right up to five minutes before the flight closes. And anybody else in the country or in the world can have the same seat on the same plane. What's more, without... Ooh, what, five minutes to spare? Surely there's a cancellation policy. ...as much as a thousand pounds. Before we get carried away with enthusiasm for these miracles of technology, oh, coffee. we should consider a more objective view. Yes. Author and journalist Rex Malik has been observing and writing about the computer world for more than 20 years. What a typewriter. That's ironic, isn't it? It's leading us to major change. Uh, some would say as unprecedented change has occurred on the precedent the industrial revolution. Now, if you're going to understand the nature of that change, you'd better understand something of the nature of the, of the technology which fuels it. In this program, they've shown you the K1, the weather center computer, a supercomputer. Yet, in comparison to what's to come, that isn't even the equivalent of a Model T Ford. The Japanese have just started a program to build a computer a hundred times as powerful. Wow. The program, they say, will take about 10 years. Wow. Okay, so it slips, say 20. That means very simply that at the end of 20 years... I don't think it will slip, mate. I think it will advance a lot faster than that. Now, why? Well, because it's going to be made out of microelectronics. And it's in the nature of microelectronics that 90% of your costs come up front. I.e. it costs you 90% of the total to build the first one. Thereafter, you can shell them out like peas. So, everybody has one. That means that a 15-year-old at school today, by the time he's 35 to 45, is going to have almost unbelievable brain and memory power added to aid him in his work. And there's another question. What people are going to use it for? Well, in fact, you're going to find that most of the time that computer's going to sit there idle. It's going to be parked just like the cars parked at the curb. Sometimes it'll go to top speed, but very seldom. Now, the question now becomes, it's not that uh, do computers have social consequences, it is what are the social consequences of computers? What are the issues that are... I don't think you've envisaged uh, remember, social media, have you? Computer and mobile phones. ...times the most powerful computer on the planet, and yet it's essentially built out of the very same technology that Chris booked his holiday on. There we go. That is the future from... A 1982 standpoint, and this was the computer program from the BBC. A little bit further back in time than what we've been looking at recently, but I, I, I love looking at these. In a way, I kind of find these more nostalgic. It's just like a deep, it just feels like a deep memory from the 80s, which I can barely remember. This music. I love it. Anyway, thank you for watching this episode. Uh, I hope to explore some more episodes of this in the future. 
until next time. See you later. A BBC publication entitled The Computer Book, which explains what computers can do and how they work, will be available from bookshops from this Friday, the price £6.75. And for details of the materials and equipment available, including the BBC microcomputer system and the linked NEC correspondence course in programming, please send a stamped addressed envelope at least 12 inches by 9 inches to Broadcasting Support Services, PO Box 7, London W3 6XJ.